Choices, choices, choices. We make hundreds of them every day. What to eat, what to wear, when to go to bed. Some like these are small, yet others are life-changing. You know, the most important choice that we'll ever make comes down to two options. Either we receive the gift of eternal life that God offers us, or we reject it in favor of making it on our own. Really, that's what it all comes down to, isn't it? In this study of Through the Bible, our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, talks more about the power of that one choice. I'm Steve Sweats, welcoming you aboard the Bible bus for another great study in God's Word. Now, in just a minute, Dr. McGee is going to ask you to grab your Bible and your notes and outlines for this study. So if you don't yet have your free copy of Dr. McGee's notes on Isaiah, or any book of the Bible for that matter, the quickest and easiest way to get them is to visit our website at ttb.org and download them immediately in one digital volume titled Briefing the Bible. Or if you want to receive an abridged version in paperback, use the online order form at ttb.org or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. And if you listen by app, you'll find the notes and outlines conveniently provided for you by clicking on the menu tab. Now, before we jump into Isaiah 8, here are a couple of quick letters from our fellow travelers. First, it's an email. This one's from Jim. I'm on my third journey through the Bible, and I'm still learning, says Jim. After two trips, I thought I had a lot of knowledge, and I did. But as I continue to listen, I still pick up information that I've missed. I am a supporter of the ministry and really admire the work that is being done to get out the word. Well, thanks for your note, Jim, and for your faithful support that keeps the Bible bus rolling, both through your neighborhood and in more than 250 languages around the world. And then here's a quick note. This is from Margaret in Ontario, Canada. She writes, I'm honored and blessed to be a part of the World Prayer Team, where everyone in Christ can come together and pray, no matter where on earth we live. I'm especially touched when we join together and call upon the name of Jesus to touch those who are spiritually blind and ask Him to help them see Him and accept Him as Lord and Savior of their lives. Thank you for your faithful prayers, Margaret. It's really great to have you on board as we travel the world on our knees, asking God to take His whole word to His whole world. And then our last note comes from Sylvia in California who writes, We've gone through the Bible in weeks, not months or years, and are starting again online. Plus, we listen to the studies two times a day on KKLA 99.5. I'm retired, so I have time to catch up on all the years wasted not reading the Bible. Well, Sylvia, I certainly love your enthusiasm. Spending more time in God's Word is definitely a worthy retirement goal. What's your story? How's God using our time in His Word in your life? Has being a part of the World Prayer Team changed you? Is there maybe a certain study that's made a difference in how you understand your relationship with Jesus? Well, you know we'd love to hear about it. You can email us at biblebus at ttb.org or send your note to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the faithfulness of your word, which always accomplishes in us what you intend. Help us to have ears to hear your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Now turn in Isaiah 8 as we make our way through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now today again, friends, I have a little scratchy voice, but I'm very anxious to continue to make these tapes in order that the word might go out. And I trust you will forgive me for that little scratchiness. It's not in your radio, but it's in this fellow here that's trying to do the speaking today. Now, as we come to the eighth chapter of the book of Isaiah, and I trust you have before you our notes and outlines, and we would like also to urge you to follow along in the Bible as we read here. It'll make it more meaningful to you. Now, we find here that the son of the prophet was named before he was born And the invasion of Emmanuel's land by the Assyrian was predicted before the child was weaned. And all of that, of course, took place in that day. And we're in a section now. It began with chapter 7. It goes through chapter 12. And it's a series of prophecies that were given during the reign of Ahaz. And you'll recall he was a godless man. And it's well to keep that before us as we go through this section here. Now, we come to this very remarkable 
statement in the first four verses, the prediction of the birth of the prophet's second son as a sign. And we are told here, Moreover, the Lord said unto me, Take thee a great roll and write in it with a man's pen concerning, and notice now this name here, and it's some name, concerning Mayor Shalal Hashbaz. Now, if you thought Sheer Jashub that we had back in the last chapter was quite a name. Try this one out now for size. How would you like to carry this cognomen through the rest of your life? And this is what this boy apparently did. I do not know what his nickname was. They may have shortened this down and called him Mayor, or they might have called him something else. They could have called him Hash or Baz, But Mayor Shalal Hashbaz is quite a name. Now, why were these two boys given these most unusual names? And verse 18 in this chapter is self-explanatory, and it will help us now in understanding the last chapter and this chapter also. Verse 18, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Zion. Now, these children are signs, and that's the reason they are given these most unusual names. Now, the name here that we have before us is a name that I think probably we ought to look at for a moment. It means hasten booty, speed prey. What does that mean? Well, I would say that the meaning is just simply this. God is against those that are against us. And Paul put it like this. If God be for us, who can be against us? Now, this was also a message for this man that was on the throne, Ahaz, a godless man. Now, God is trying to reach him. And the thing that Isaiah is to do, and this is a direct word to Isaiah, he's to get a great big tablet. I do not know just what kind it would be, but he was to get this large tablet, and it's one that could be hung up in a prominent place like a billboard, and he is to write on it with a man's pen. Now, actually, it means the stylus of a frail mortal man. And what God is saying is this. I want it written so that the most humble person that's in the kingdom can see this and read it and understand this strange compound word that is here. Now, will you notice that God is trying to get a message through to this man on the throne. And he's used the firstborn, Shear Jashub, and that was quite a name. And now we have Mayor Shalal Hashbaz, and that means hasten booty, speed prey, and simply God's against those that's against us. That is a message for this man. Now, notice the second verse. And I took unto me faithful witnesses to record, or for the record, Uriah the priest, Zechariah the son of Jeberichiah. Now, we got some more pretty good names. Now, what you have here is Uriah. That means Jehovah is my light. And Zechariah means Jehovah remembers. And Jeberichiah means Jehovah will bless. And here you have it. It's a very interesting combination, is it not? Thus, the one witness says by his name, Jehovah is my light. And the other says, Jehovah's purpose is to bless. And the offspring of that is the grace of God. That is, 
he'll never forget his people. Now, that's interesting, is it not? You see, in all of the actions of Isaiah, what he's doing, there is a message for these people. In other words, he's speaking to them really by television. He's acting this out, writing this out, putting up so that the people will get it. In other words, it's a picture parable. And our Lord used that method also. And one of the reasons was this, that people will look at the picture or hear a picture. And you can listen to a picture. And that's what you have here. You know, they call the television day the boob tube. It's amazing how some of us will sit in front of that idiot box and look at things that you and I under normal circumstances, in a different situation, we wouldn't waste our time. Isn't that amazing? God knows the inclination of mankind, and so he's trying to get through a message here to his people, and this is the way that he does it. Now, in verse 3, we see the working out of this. Isaiah says, And I went unto the prophetess, that was his wife, Mrs. Isaiah, and she conceived and bare a son. Then said the Lord to me, call his name, Mayor Shalal Hashbaz. Now the child's name was given to him before he was born, and this is the name. Now will you notice, verse 4, For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, my father and my mother, he won't be able to say mommy and daddy. And before he's able to say mommy and daddy, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. In other words, this enemy in the north that's planning to come against you is going to be taken away into captivity. Now, it won't be because of the brilliant military ability of this man, he has to work out a strategy that'll give him victory. It's due to the sovereign grace of God that this will take place. God's making that very clear. Will you notice verse 5? The Lord spake also unto me again, saying, For as much as this people refuseth the waters of Shiloh that go softly and rejoice in resin, and Remaliah's son, now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory, and he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. Now, this is another remarkable passage of Scripture. The people refuseth Shiloh. Now, the waters of Shiloh. What are the waters of Shiloh? Well, there is a contrast made here with the flood of waters that's in the seventh verse here. Bring up the waters of the river, strong and many. Well, that's evidently the Tigris-Euphrates River. That's where Assyria was located. And they come down like a flood. But in contrast to that are the waters of Shiloh. Well, the waters of Shiloh, and Shiloh means scent. It's in contrast or an antithesis to the Euphrates. And the Euphrates comes down like a great flood. But Shiloh, it's gentle. It ripples as a brook. And here the contrast is made. Euphrates represents judgment. And God's given a message. You remember it was Shakespeare that said, tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in stones, and good in everything. Well, Shiloh, softly flowing. And it was that little spring that is there, not doing much today, but it did in that day, and does today to a certain extent, it flows between Mount Zion and Mount Moriah. And if you're listening and you've got that blood-tipped ear today, you're going to hear a voice 
sweeter than even the rippling music of this stream as it flows down from between Zion and Mount Moriah. And may I say to you, what a message is in that little stream. It's a story of grace. And Mount Zion is in contrast to Mount Sinai that stands for law. And Moriah, that's where Abraham offered his son. That's where David bought the threshing floor of Araunah. And that's where Solomon put up the temple. And down at the end of that great shaft of rocks is Golgotha, where Christ was crucified. And that speaks of grace, too, because here is where God provided himself a lamb. He spared Abraham's son, but he didn't spare his own son. And so what we have here is God is speaking grace to this man. God says, I'll spare you. And if you'll only but turn to me. And now will you notice verse 8. He shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow, go over. He shall reach even to the neck. And the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel. Now you see, God permitted the Assyrian to cover the land, but never permitted him to take Jerusalem. Now verse 9, associate yourselves O ye people, ye shall be broken in pieces. Give ear, all ye of far countries. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Now, this is a warning against nations who form an alliance against God's land. And beginning with chapter 13, we are going to have a series of messages to the nations that were contiguous to Israel, or at least had dealings with them in that day, and the judgment of God that has come upon those nations. And that section from 13 that goes all the way up to 35 is, to my judgment, one of the most remarkable sections in the Word of God. Most of it is fulfilled prophecy. God says that you'll never succeed against his purpose here upon the earth. And it's interesting today that the nations of the world no longer seek wisdom from God and counsel from God because God does have a purpose and his purpose will primarily prevail. And if a nation goes the other direction, judgment will come, of course. Now he goes on to say, Take counsel together, it shall come to naught. Speak the word, it shall not stand, for God's with us. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of the people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom the people shall say a confederacy, neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Now, Judah was not to be alarmed by the confederacy. And it was fear that it caused those in the north to unite. And God urges them not to fear their fear, as he says here. In other words, they were not to turn to another ally themselves, which would probably have been Egypt, which they did later on, and which brought a very great tragedy to the land. Now he says here, sanctify, this is verse 13, sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread. They were to fear God above and look to him. Either he is to be their salvation or a stone of stumbling. Notice what he says, verse 14, he shall be for a sanctuary but for a stone of stumbling, for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Someone asked Cromwell once why he was such a brave man, and he had that reputation, by the way, that he was one of the bravest men that ever lived. He said, I have learned that when you fear God, you have no man to fear. And here is the same thing that Paul speaks of. We preach Christ crucified, 
to the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness. And that is a tremendous thing. The Lord Jesus said, either you fall on this stone, and he is that stone, if you fall on him for salvation, rest upon him. He's the only foundation you can rest on. You fall on him, you'll be saved. But if he, the stone, falls on you, it grinds you to powder. That is, if he judges you. You see, you have two options. You can either accept him or you can reject him. And then here's another remarkable statement. Sanctify the Lord of hosts. And you find Peter using that in 1 Peter 3.15. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. And that is something that I believe today that God's people need to do. There is this light thinking about God, a lack of reverence for him, a lack of reverence for the word of God, actually ridiculing sometimes things that are sacred, making light of things that should not be made light of. And you and I need to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. Multitudes of people today are not convinced the Lord's in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. If they believe, friends, he was in your church on Sunday morning, they wouldn't be down at the beach. They wouldn't be out in the picnic area. They would not be mowing the backyard. They'd be with you. You and I haven't convinced them, have we? Now we find out, as we move on down here, verse 19, and when they shall say unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, shall not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead. And this is something that is reappearing again today. I wrote this many years ago. In fact, now, about 15 years ago, God forbids his people to dabble in this satanic system. When a people turn from God, they generally go after the occult and abnormal. And I'm not going to dwell on it, don't have time to, but there is a great turning today to the occult, a great turning to the spirit world and to demonology. Many are worshiping the devil today. And then even Christians dabble in this. Many of them talk about they are a group that are casting out demons. My friend, I'm not in that business. I'm preaching the gospel of the grace of God and the word of God, and that will take care of all the demons. I say that we need to let this thing alone today, for it's a dangerous thing, and it's growing by leaps and bounds. And if you don't think there's reality to it, you're wrong. There's reality in it, just as the fact that Satan is a reality. And this is the thing that he gives a warning against, and that warning holds good today. Now we're going to leave off right there because these final verses reveal the final issue of pursuing a life of disobedience which will lead you into spiritualism. And the result is dimness, darkness, and despair and it'll take you there every time. So until next time, may the Lord richly bless you, my beloved. God's Word speaks so plainly about the dangers of Satanism and the occult. As Dr. McGee pointed out, Satan is real. Please heed the warning and put the whole armor of God on that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. To help you better understand spiritual warfare, Dr. McGee has several free downloadable booklets on this topic. They're easy to find. Just visit ttb.org forward slash booklets and look for these three titles. Number one, How to Stand Against Satan. 
two, the battle of the gods, and three, Satan, who is he? Again, you'll find them over at ttb.org. If you have any trouble getting them, just call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. And while you're there, you'll definitely want to download The Radical Cost of the Cross. It's our deepest hope to help you connect with God through His Word. So feel free to spend a few minutes wandering through the resources at ttb.org and check out the many great Bible study materials that you can get for free. I'm Steve Schwetz, and it's always a joy to study God's Word alongside you. Now, next time, we continue this wonderful ride through the book of Isaiah. I'll be here, and be sure to save a seat just for you. Jesus came in home, home to him I home. Sin had left a crimson Today's study with Dr. J. Vernon McGee is brought to you by Through the Bible, and it's made possible by the generous prayer and financial investments from listeners like you on the Bible bus all around the world.